welcome everyone. Uh, thanks a lot for joining us. My name is Eric Deggins and I'm TV critic for National Public Radio. And we're gonna tackle, you know, a small topic, race in America. <laughs> Solve it in about a half an hour. You guys will get out of here early, I'm sure. So, um, so one thing I, I did wanna point out, as the um, uh, introducer said, we're gonna take questions at the end of this. So um, I'll ask a question and let you guys know, and you can start lining up at these mics over here. So while we're talking, uh, start thinking of what you might wanna ask these wonderful men. And yes, we do want questions, not speeches. So <laughs> let's start. Uh, on the far right, we have um, the distinguished Henry Louis Gates, Jr. author of Stony the Road. Next to him is Steve Luxemburg, author of Separate, the story of Plessy versus Ferguson. And next to him is Justice Richard Gergel, author of Unexampled, Unex uh, Unexampled Courage, The Blinding of Isaac Woodard. These are three very important books. And three very important books that talk about the progress and the, uh, and the backlash against progress and civil rights in America. And we're gonna get into that, but first we wanna show a little clip um, that will tell you a little bit about the reconstruction documentary that aired on PBS uh, that Dr. Gates um, spearheaded and that Stony the Road is based on. This will give you a sense of some of the stuff we're gonna talk about and then we'll talk and then you'll talk. So this is gonna be cool. Here we go, let's check it out. Most of us know that our country fought a civil war in the 1860s, but less is known about what came afterward, the chaotic, exhilarating, and ultimately devastating period known as Reconstruction. Did you ever study Reconstruction in school? No. A paragraph or two. We never really studied it. I didn't learn anything about Reconstruction. <laughs> Reconstruction was our shining moment. It's the second founding of our country. Overnight, people who have been defined as property take leadership positions in the South. So this is an incredibly heady moment, kind of like Barack Obama becoming president. But those black folks had no idea of the cliff they were heading towards. Reconstruction produced a violent backlash a racist backlash. I want us to tell the truth about our history, not to punish America. Mm -hmm. I want to liberate us, but we can't get to liberation if we don't acknowledge what we've done. It's our town now! Do you believe that we as a nation are still undergoing the process of reconstruction? You might almost say it never ended. We are still trying to come to terms with the consequences of the end of slavery in this country. This is a chapter of our history that's been misrepresented and misunderstood. It's time that we acknowledge the true story and complete the work of reconstructing America. So, thank you. Skip, I want to start with the question to you, um, and we've talked about this. Uh, people have learned about the reconstruction in school, but they didn't learn about the redemption. Right. And why don't you talk a little bit about what you've discovered both in the book and in the PBS documentary to tell us about what we should know about the reconstruction and how it relates to what we're going through today politically. Well, I studied, I took my first black history course. It was called Afro-American History. We were Afro-Americans at that time. <laughs> That was before right. Jesse Jackson had a press conference and told us we were African Americans. Right? <laughs> <laughs> in 1969, 1970 at Yale. And we had to read W.E.B. Du Bois's book, Black Reconstruction, followed by another black Harvard educated historian, Rayford Logan, who wrote a book called The Betrayal of the Negro. Du Bois's book ends in, it, Du Bois's book subtitle is 1860 to 1877. Rayford Logan starts in 1877 and goes to 1915. Wow. So my whole exposure to Reconstruction, which I had never heard of till I took this course, because it wasn't taught in my school, um, what my whole exposure to Reconstruction was coterminous 
with its rollback, which is called redemption. Now you might want to uh, ask yourself why the rise of white supremacy would be called redemption, but that was the metaphor that the former Confederate states used because they were redeeming the purity of their movement. And in fact, they named their movement the Lost Cause uh, Movement. And what's astonishing to me is that the rollback of Reconstruction lasted far longer than Reconstruction itself. Reconstruction, most historians um, date from 1865 to 1877. That's Eric Foner's uh, definition. And, but then the rollback took a long time. So in that 16, I'm not gonna give you a lecture on Reconstruction, but just a couple amazing uh, things that I had no idea about. In that 12-year um, um, period, 16 black men were elected to Congress, only men could vote. Uh, 14 to the House, two to the Senate, okay? Now, here's the mo most amazing uh, thing that I, I learned. Because of the Civil Rights Act of 1866, which is still on the books, and uh, uh, the Reconstruction Acts of 1866, 1867, black men in the former Confederacy the former slaves got the right to vote in 1867, okay? If you were a free black person, you only could vote in the United States in five of the six, Confeder um, five of the six New England states. Thank you, Michelle. Five, give it up to Michelle, please, for giving me my award. <laughs> you could only vote, if you were a free black person and had been free for generations, you could only vote in five of the six New England states, not in Connecticut, and in New York State, if you had $250 worth of property. Free black men, in other words, got the right to vote because of the 15th Amendment, which is ratified in 1870. Three years before, because of the Reconstruction Amendments, the former enslaved black men in 10 of the 11 Confederate states got the right to vote. And here's the punchline. 80% of these eligible, um, uh, these black men, former slaves, are eligible to vote. 99% were illiterate because it was illegal to teach a slave to read and write. 80% of them registered to vote in the summer of 1867. 80%! And in 1868, they elected U.S. Grant, President of the United States. Now, how can I say that? Grant overwhelmingly won the Electoral College, but he only won the popular vote by 300 thousand odd votes. 500,000 black men voted for U.S. Grant in 18... Black men had elected a president of the United States, and they did the same thing in 1872. So final surprise, Eric, there were three majority black states in the United States. South Carolina, Mississippi, Louisiana, majority black. Georgia, Alabama, and Florida, almost majority black. And this scared the bejesus out of people in the South and people in the North because it was, as someone says in the film, the first manifestation of black power. Yeah. And the Reconstruction was rolled back through a conspiracy by white people in the North and white people in the South because it was too much power and cotton remained the leading export in the United States through the 1930s. That is the truth. It was about the money. Racism fundamentally is about the, economics. It, that's where the rubber hits the road. Yeah. And we didn't learn any of that in school. So, so, so Steve, your, your book is about Plessy versus Ferguson, the Supreme Court decision uh, that helps enshrine segregation. And it's, it's a decision that a lot of people don't understand. And the ramifications of it, they don't understand. They don't understand how it came to be. What do people most misunderstand about Plessy and how it affects even where we are today? Well, I say it's the, it's the most misunderstood famous case in US Supreme Court history. Uh, most people would say that Plessy was ejected from a railroad car, for example, but it was not an ejection. He was, it was an arranged arrest. Right. And it was critical that it was an arranged arrest because they were challenging the first criminalization of a passenger who had decided to sit in the car reserved for white people. They didn't want to sue, they didn't want to have a civil suit because that wasn't going to overturn the Louisiana law which was passed in 1890. And as, as Skip was saying, 
the southern states in this rollback, they were going through a progression and what was formerly a custom. It's very important to note that separation, racial separation, is not a southern idea. It's a northern idea. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Because in the civil, before the Civil War, mm -hmm. in the South, you would not separate master and enslaved people. Mm -hmm. It's in the North where free blacks, very few free blacks, in the state of Massachusetts, mm -hmm. where you teach, mm -hmm. in the state <laughs> of Massachusetts, in the, in the 1840 census, there's fewer than 1% of the population are black, mm -hmm. and yet, when three of the eight railroad companies that begin operation at the dawn of the railroad age, they decide to separate their passengers. Why would they do that? This is not a problem that needed to be solved. Right. And of those 1%, very few of them were riding railroad trains. <laughs> right. But there was a very important group riding railroad trains, and that was the abolitionists. And among the abolitionists, the youngest, newest member of the abolitionists was Frederick Douglass. And when they tried to eject him from the railroad train, according to his memoir, he required first six people to oust him. <laughs> <laughs> and secondly, he said, he grabbed the seat of the railroad car train, uh, of the railroad car, and he was so strong that he lifted it up off its bolts. Right. <laughs> I don't think that story was probably true. But <laughs> it's nice to believe it. It's a good story. So what we misunderstand is that my book is, off, is about two narratives. And one narrative is about the people who make the decision in Plessy and their lives and where they come from, but the other narrative is about the people who resist, the black men and women who resist separation. And you can't have one without the other. You can't have a legal case unless somebody brings that case, whether it's an arrest or a civil suit. Mm -hmm. the, the, the resistance is what animates the narrative because and, and, and what I found was, if you look at the Plessy decision, and there are a number of precedents, most of those cases are not individuals acting on their own without support. They're part of a group, whether it's the abolitionist group or whether it's some other group. There's always some support because resisting is hard. Resisting alone is harder. <clears throat> And the most important thing you can do in the face of intimidation and violence, and that's what people faced on public transportation, among other places, the most important thing you can do is to stand up and say no, and you have to have somebody behind you. So, so Richard, um, your book upset me the most <laughs> because I should know who Isaac Woodard is, and I don't. So tell us who Isaac Woodard is, and tell us how pivotal he was in the cause of advancing civil rights in America. Well, Isaac Woodard was a African-American um, soldier, sergeant, battlefield decorated, and on his day of discharge, after three years of military service, he gets into a dispute with a white bus driver on the way home, literally the last leg home to Winsboro, South Carolina, where he's to rendezvous with his wife after three years of separation. He asks, can I step off the bus to use the restroom? And the bus driver takes offense that the effrontery of a black man to ask even one in a dress uniform with battlefield decorations. And he curses Woodard, and to his surprise, Woodard curses him back mm -hmm. and says, speak to me like I'm a man. I am a man just like you. Mm -hmm. At the next stop, they said, go ahead, get off. You can come, but at the next stop, he steps off the bus and has Woodard arrested. And on the way to the jail, the police chief of Batesburg, South Carolina, beats him and blinds him. Uh -huh. uh, and the story of it becomes a major issue in the African American press and eventually reaches Harry Truman, who is outraged that a battlefield decorated soldier has been treated this way and directs the prosecution of the police chief. Now, in 1946, Mm -hmm. They are not prosecutions mm -hmm. of white cops for beating black citizens. This mm -hmm. is an extraordinary event mm -hmm. in the South. In the South or anywhere. I yeah. mean, they're just that's not being that's not occurring. Mm -hmm. And um, the, and Truman is so moved by this story of the beating of Isaac Woodard that in the letter in which he writes the Attorney General and directs the prosecution, mm 
he also says we need to do more than just prosecute, mm -hmm. and we need to establish a presidential committee on civil rights. And out of that committee comes the desegregation of the armed forces of the United States, right. triggered by the incident blinding of Isaac Woodard. Mm -hmm. The case is tried before J. Waitis Waring, a United States district judge in Charleston, who never had a particular interest in issues of race and justice. But when that all-white, all-male jury acquitted um, the police officer in 28 minutes, Waring is horrified. Mm -hmm. And it sends him on a journey of study and reflection that eventually makes him the first of the great Southern civil rights judges. Right. And he eventually writes the great dissent in Briggs versus Elliott, which is one of the four cases that comes, goes up to be Brown versus Board, and it is Waring's reasoning that becomes Brown. Yeah, it's amazing. All out of Isaac Woodard's blinding. Yeah, it's true. And it just shows you, and, and really like the three books we're talking about show you this progression of, um, you know, redemption, Plessy, and then Truman gets inspired, and the desegregation of the armed forces inspires, it becomes an argument for desegregating schools. It, we see this flow of history through the, the three books. Well, and one of the lessons, one of the common threads, is the role of the courts. Yeah. The, um, the, the Reconstruction couldn't have been rolled back without the role of conservative Supreme Court. Right. Um, I won't bore you with the details, but there was a slaughterhouse case in 1873, Crookshank in 1876, and then the famous civil rights case of 18, cases of 1883, which rendered null and void effectively the Civil Rights Act of 1875. And one of the reasons I wanted to tell that story, oh, and then would, would you tell the story of, of Judge Waring, he is so shocked. He's an eighth generation Charlestonian, if I'm remembering correctly. Right. Eighth generation, eighth generation Charlestonian. He doesn't have, as my daddy would say, a nickel in that dime of civil rights, right? <laughs> but he was a decent man. And he even gets to the point, in 1944, during the war, and Your Honor, you correct me, I'm just, I blurbed his book, I'll, everything I'm saying I got from his book. But he settles for a man, Thurgood Marshall is his lawyer, and he's suing for equal pay for equal work. Correct. And that's a revolutionary thing. He goes, yes. Well, he's using Plessy as a sword. Huh? If Plessy yes. was supposed to be right. put down the black man. Right. And what uh, Charles Hamilton Houston and Thurgood Marshall were doing was they said, let's turn it against right. the South. Yes, we're going to have separate, but you're going to pay us equally. But you needed a, a white judge to play along with the game. And he did it. And he did it. And he encouraged Thurgood Marshall to keep pushing. And, and, and push for another case, which was a year later, I believe. Correct. And then that ended up being punted to the Supreme Court. And he knew it would be because he wrote the dissent, right? Right. He writes the dissent that becomes Brown. He writes a dissent that becomes Brown. That's an amazing story. So that we, what, we, what you're seeing on the stage are, are three people who wrote books about the role of the judiciary in different independent ways. And the lesson to take away as we, um, you know, RBG was here this morning, right? Mm -hmm. And it's, we have a five to four court, and it's, you know, um, the, the lesson of, the most important lesson for, of Reconstruction for me is that rights that we think are inviolable, rights that we think are permanent, like a woman's right to choose, uh, affirmative action, uh, you, you fill in the rest of the list, can be taken away just like that. And that's why we have to register and vote. That's right. So, one of the things that's interesting to me about uh, the material in several of your books is uh, I, I'm reminded of critical race theory and I'm reminded of Derrick Bell. And I'm reminded of this idea that uh, civil rights, some people believe that civil rights advances only happen for black people when white people get something out of it too. And it's interesting, particularly in your book, uh, Richard, this idea that uh, one reason why Truman uh, actually defeated Dewey was because of the black vote. The reason. Right. You talk about Grant. 
um, Truman is elected. That's true. Um, stunning upset because of massive African American turnout in about four urban states, mm -hmm. swing states, and it, American politics would never be the same. It's I true. mean, uh, it's a. And, and there's also this concern that America will look hypocritical trying to woo countries into the American European alliance. We look like hypocrites. Communists but let me, when let you me treat mention white something about, so about the rule of, the importance of the courts and the rule of law. For much of American history, the courts were the were the place where civil rights claims went to die. Right? <laughs> That's true, yeah. Right. Um, Dred Scott. Yeah. Um, all that whole line of, of, of cases. Dred, Dred, Dred Scott said that black people were not citizens of the United States. Were not, no matter where they lived. Free or enslaved. It's, um, um, Plessy is the culmination of a whole line of cases that had pretty much gutted um, uh, the uh, Civil Rights Act and the, and the Civil War Amendments. And then there's Williams versus Mississippi, which basically sanctioned state disenfranchisement. That's right. And really, until 1939 with Gaines versus Canada, the courts had not embraced the cause of civil rights. Mm -hmm. And really, it's a slow process. The ending of the white primary in Smith versus Allwright, the ending of segregation on dining cars in Henderson versus FCC, and then Brown versus Board, and then the whole line of Warren Court cases. That is only a piece of the American history. And it, you know, I'm, I'm not going to get into a debate about a court that reviews my my cases, okay, I, I won't get into that. But I will, I will say that, that, that nothing is permanent in the law. Right. Stare decisis, the rule is an, is an important principle, but it's not an invite, right. invite principle. And also, as you say, there, there has to be people who advocate the law because the law, the judges do not do this by their own initiative. Right. You have to have people standing up for their rights. Well, look at the most famous dissent. What, what did Martin Luther King say about it? And you should talk about it. It's Harlan's dissent in Plessy. Uh, well, let me, I, I don't have any problem with people reviewing my cases. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was going to ask so, you about so that. So let me say that it's very important, I think, for us not to look at the Supreme Court of the 19th century through 21st century eyes. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? We talk today of a 5-4 court. We talk of diversity. We have Sotomayor. We have Ginsburg. We have Kagan. In the 19th century, you had nine white men. Mm -hmm. They were all of the same class. They were all of same privilege. They all had wealth. They all saw the world And much. they were all Episcopalians. Yeah. <laughs> they all, and they were all, <laughs> except for Harlan and, and a late addition to the court in Plessy, they were all Northerners, not yeah. Southerners. Right. right. Harlan was from Kentucky, right? Harlan's from Kentucky. He's the only Southerner, and right. he's the only dissenter in Plessy. And he's the only dissenter in the civil rights cases of 1883. Right. His evolution is a remarkable one. Mm -hmm. It's not a complete one. He's a flawed individual. He even refers to white supremacy in his, in his dissent by saying that, well, of course, the white race will always be the superior one. Mm -hmm. He also is anti-Chinese. But he goes from being a pro-slavery candidate for Congress in 1859, mm -hmm. to, uh, and he opposes the civil rights amendments after the Civil War. And the Emancipation Proclamation. <laughs> and, and he opposes them on the grounds that these are states' issues. Mm -hmm. If we're going to abolish slavery in Kentucky, we do it, not the Congress. Mm -hmm. He changes his mind. He completely turns that over. And by 1883, he writes this ringing dissent in the civil rights cases, which he cares about more than any other dissent that he wrote up until that moment. Mm. Because he knew as a Southerner he would be scrutinized. Right. And he couldn't write it for a long time. He was, he was writer's block. His wife claims that she helped him by placing the inkwell that Justice Taney used to write Dred Scott. Oh my God. On his writing desk. Wow. Wow. And said his pen flew the next day. <laughs> Taney's the devil. <laughs> and Harlan loved the delicious irony of using that inkwell, which yeah. he had retrieved from the Supreme Court supply office. That's correct. Wow. Where it had been unused. That's a great story. Ever since. Yeah. But the, the, uh, in Plessy, uh, he is known for this dissent, but as I say, there are, there are flaws in the dissent, but yeah. it's the evolution of a man who was pro-slavery, who was opposed to the Civil Rights Amendment, to being the only dissenter. It must not be easy, I, you would know better than I would, to sit in a room with eight other justices and be the only one saying we must have equal rights. Especially in 1896, 
Exactly. And he, he was consistent about it. Yeah. Well, I, I wanted to ask uh, Richard about this. So we have this judge who, um, you know, hears Isaac Woodard's story and it transforms him. His wife is in tears after she leaves the, the, um, the acquittal. Um, how did they not know what black people were going through at that time? Well, you know, it's caused me to, um, uh, this, this work has caused me to look hard at other Southern whites who came of awakened during this era. And they all arose from a racist past. They were raised in racism. Charleston was certainly among the most segregated cities in America when Waitis Waring uh, was growing up. How could he miss the, um, the treatment of African Americans? But Southerners had kind of blinder zone about this. And what that trial did was it stripped the blinds away. He suddenly saw the world as it, as it existed. And he found it intolerable. And he was like the, the um, you know, the only man with sight in a colony of blind people. Yeah. He just, and he felt, you know, and you talk about courage. He had a very comfortable life in Charleston. He was at the top of the social heap. He had eight generations of uh, Charlestonians. His parents, his family had been prominent for multiple generations. And he became the most ostracized, vilified man in the white South. Yeah. And he did it with his eyes open. He knew when he came home, after he got the white primary case, Elmer versus Rice, he told his wife, our lives will never be the same if I allow black people to vote. Yeah. And she said, you, you gotta do your job. Right. And he did it with his eyes open. And that's you know, one of the, 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 term, the title of my book, Unexampled Courage, comes from his dissent, the great dissent in Briggs, and he refers to the plaintiffs in Briggs v. Elliott living in this little southern town knowing they were going to be vilified and ostracized for what they did, they signed up as plaintiffs with Thurgood Marshall. And he says, these plaintiffs have shown unexampled courage. Mm -hmm. It took so, unexampled courage. So Skip, I, I want to ask you a question. Okay. Um, Can I make a, just a little comment? Sure, sure, of course. The reason, you have to understand why, all the, why South Carolina is so important. Why, I know you can't comment about Dylan Roof, but I could at least say, <laughs> he's a judge in the Dylan Roof case. <laughs> Um, but if, 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 you had, if someone had, had awakened me and said, guess where someone has just killed um, black people at a church, I would have said Charleston. Charleston was ground zero for black power. It was the blackest state in the Union. 48% approximately of all of our enslaved African ancestors entered the United States through Charleston. It was, as I said earlier, majority black um, state. And, and Reconstruction, oh well, of, of all, by 1901, when the last Reconstruction congressman was kicked out, uh, there had been 20 black men elected to Congress, uh, tw 22, 22 to the House, two to the Senate, eight came from South Carolina. Seven at one time. All yes, seven. seven at one time. Now, why? You think, why? Because one, it had all these slaves, but it also had a large free black community. It's a paradox. Here is a, a, a paradoxical thing. It's like you could take it home and t tell your friends. That there were, in 1860, there were 488,000 free black people living in the United States and 3.9 million slaves. Of those 488,000 free black people, you think they all would live north of the Mason-Dixon line, right? Makes sense? As soon as you could run away from slavery? Wrong. 262,000 lived in the states where slavery was legal. Three sets of my fourth great grandparents. I am from Piedmont, West Virginia, is 120 miles up the Potomac from here, near Cumberland, Maryland. Some of you know where Cumberland is. All the gates are from Cumberland, Maryland, and my mother's family, Piedmont, West Virginia, is halfway between Pittsburgh and D.C. I descend from three sets, three sets of free black people who lived, who were free from the 18th century on, they lived 30 miles from where I was born. 30 miles from where I was born. My family never moved from this area, the Allegheny Mountains and the, the Potomac River Valley, right? Near Deep Creek Lake. And why didn't they move? Because in Virginia, remember it was Virginia until June 20th, 1863, Master had to give you land. 
So when the last of my three sets of fourth grade grandparents were freed in 1823, they got a thousand acres of land from Abraham Van Meter in Hardy County, now West Virginia. What are you gonna do? Leave yeah. your land, go to Boston and New York and be homeless? Give me a break. All these people stayed in the South. The only reason Martin Luther King family left the South, or he left the South, was to go to BU to get a PhD. <laughs> the South has had an old, long, continuous middle and upper middle class that never went anywhere. That's really important in the Plessy case because I say in the book that it's unlikely that the Plessy case would have been brought in any other city in the United States other than New Orleans. Yep. Because it was brought by a mixed race group of free blacks. Mm -hmm. They had been freed for ever 100 years. And by the 1890s, they were pissed. Right. They spoke, fr <laughs> and they spoke French. That's a technical term. Yeah. <laughs> That's a historical term. They had fought in the War of 1812. I'm, I'm going to break in real quick and yep. say we're going to start taking questions. So why don't you guys start lining up at these mics, and I'm going to I'm going to ask uh, one more question of uh, uh, Professor Gates, and then we'll we'll start getting you guys in the conversation. We're just getting started, man. I know, I know. So. So the whole point of this is this Call idea. Call off your dinner plans. <laughs> the whole point of this is this idea that we learn from history. Yes. And that history can show us the way, can inform where we are right now. So we look at uh, the story of Reconstruction and we see this idea of civil rights progress followed by a huge backlash. And some might say that may have sort of happened more recently. Right. With a certain person. Right. Getting elected to the White House after a black president. Right. I'm not saying any names, <laughs> but what is the solution? Since you guys are the experts on history, since Dr. Gates, you have this great documentary and book on reconstruction and redemption, how do we redeem the redemption? How do we redeem the modern? Well, I, I think that's an excellent question. I, um, I believe that I definitely think the emergence of white supremacy in its bald manifestations since the last general election, if you want me to put it that way, is definitely tied to the fact that there was a black family living in the White House for eight years. I can't see how anybody in this room could doubt that, okay? Um, I think that drove some of our fellow Americans crazy. We thought, I interviewed Andy Young recently, I'm doing the history of the black church. It's my new series. So I interviewed Andy Young. Mm -hmm. He said he thought our people had a freedom high. We were still on a freedom high, you know, like Barack's election and right. solve racism. And you remember all those books and articles at the beginning, we're beyond race, the end of race, racism is over. I didn't Guess believe it. But. What? <laughs> I didn't believe it either. But it was America at its best. The election of Barack Obama is America at its best. When we elected the best person for the job. But because, as Eric Foner says in that clip, because so many issues um, of race and class were not resolved by Reconstruction, right? Yeah. They've just been simmering, mm -hmm. simmering. Now, I don't, I don't want to, I'm not trying to vilify South Carolina or South Carolinians. I'm just using it as, a, as an example. But so for... Um, uh, um, I don't know, I'm not saying everybody who supports Donald Trump's a racist. People, and let me be clear, people ask me, is Donald Trump a racist? I say only God knows what's in a person's heart. And I don't, I'm not into name calling. But I do know that Donald Trump is a genius at manipulating the tropes of white supremacy. And what we have to do is fight any manifestation of white supremacy and crush it whenever it, it right, raises its ugly head. All right. Let's start right here. If you could just tell us your name and then give us your question. Um, hello, my name is Najee Royster. Um, a couple of you brought up uh, how things have like changed or how like, you know, we may have moved on from what was happening during Reconstruction and Jim Crow like in ways like that. My 40, a lot of people believe that uh, the election of 45 was the start of blatant racism. They're like, oh my gosh, this was not my America. I don't know what's going on. <laughs> um, but he just gave racist white America another platform to show they were racist because even when Barack Obama was elected, everybody showed their asses about how racist they were because they were upset because a white man was leading 
this, excuse me, because a black man was in a uh, powerful position in this country. So what do you think the ramifications are of allowing people to phrase this as something new when in reality they are just showing how racist they've always been? What are the ramifications of like, oh my gosh, we've got past this, when in reality we haven't? Because by doing so, we allow white people to continue thinking that this is something that we've overcome and they're lessening it, when in reality structural oppression and structural racism is still a very strong issue. Who's that directed to? Any of you. <laughs> oh, okay, anybody? Let me, let me, say, that, let me say this. Um, when the first African stepped off that um, boat in Virginia in 1619, 400 years ago this year, this was the great sin of America, right? Slavery. The great constitutional convention was compromised because southern states would not join if slavery could be abolished. And this is the great unresolved issue where, you know, we're trying to create the more perfect union. And we have made progress. The world of Isaac Woodard in 1946, the world of lynching in the late 19th and early 20th century, mm -hmm. is not the same as today. That doesn't mean there's not racism today, but it's taking different varieties, it's not as virulent, and there is the vote, mm -hmm. right? African Americans vote. Mm -hmm. um, Thurgood Marshall was once asked, uh, what is your most important case? And, every, and, the, and the interviewer was expecting him to say, of course, Brown. Mm -hmm. He said, um, Smith versus Allwright. He mm -hmm. said, what was that? <laughs> and he said, that is the Texas white primary case because I always figured if we got the vote, everything else would work itself out. Right, absolutely. You know, I, I would say that race is our national conversation. We are either talking about it or we're avoiding talking about it. Yeah, yeah. And oh, the, the job more? of the historians, but also any storyteller, is to remind us that white supremacy is not a new thing. Right. And unless white people, people like us, why are we writing these histories? Why are we engaging in this? Unless we write these stories, we cannot have this conversation in a real way. Yeah. White supremacy is not new. We all know that. And just because it's simmering and buried doesn't mean it's gone. And it won't be gone until we have this conversation in a, in a real and continuing way, both in elections and outside of elections. Yeah. And it's very important that we historicize, meaning that we don't talk about a phenomenon as if it's frozen in time and it's the same at all points in our nation's history. And that's one of the um, surprises of my re doing the Reconstruction film. We had anti-black racism to justify um, claims that people of African descent were genetically, biologically inferior in order to justify slavery from the 17th century at least, and certainly at the height of the Enlightenment. But after the Civil War, anti-black racism morphed into something else. Why? Because black people all of a sudden had all this power. The genie was out of the lamp, and you had to put the genie back in again. And I'll give you one little example. There were very few claims that black men raped white women before the end of the Civil War. And Frederick Douglass and many other people, Ida B. Wells, who were fighting lynching, use that as an example. They go, if black men have a natural propensity to want to rape white women, how come they didn't do it during the Civil War when the white men were away fighting the North? And they didn't. They, there are no, no, virtually none that I can even think of, but I'm sure some historian can fact check them. I mean, it, I'm sure it probably happened. But it becomes the claim we have to protect white womanhood from these black predators who are venal, you know, genetically. Mm -hmm. How many of you saw, um, when you were in school, um, Birth of a Nation? Birth of a Nation. So Birth of a Nation, everybody remembers it as being about the Civil War. It's about the rollback of Reconstruction and the excesses of black men in the South Carolina legislature. And there's one scene, they have their feet up, they're eating chicken wings, drinking whiskey, and all of a sudden they cheer and they've just passed a uh, miscegenation law saying that, that it's legal for uh, black men and, and you know, people of different races to get married. And the whole 
arc, narrative arc of the film is about Gus the rapist. Yep. A black man who's trying to rape this white, white woman. woman. And in the book, himself. he yeah. does rape the white woman. This is, and it's something I dwell on in my book. This is an invention of the redemption period and the rollback of reconstruction. It didn't exist in the pre-Civil War times. So that's amazing. So I'm just saying that we have to study how anti-black racism rose, changed, uh, continued, went underground, resurfaced in order to fight it. How do I think the best way to fight it? Through education, through proximity, through the, the, the surprising fact that so many uh, black and white kids go to, to segregated schools today, all these years after Brown, it's a shock. If people, Earl Warren came back or Thurgood, they would have a heart attack. I mean, they couldn't believe that all deliberate speed was translated into the situation that we're, we're exactly. seeing today. Exactly. Now, what I will ask is that one panelist answer one question, because we want to get more people. Go ahead. <laughs> Amen. Um, glory to God. I am the missionary, Miss Range. I am the IP owner, the copyright author of Black Lives Matter, All Lives Matter, and Blue Lives Matter. It is my sermon. And um, the hijacking of my work is part of a racist act. It's actually a blackface act in that there's a false narrative that's gone forward. I have no three co-founders, I have no organizations, and blacklivesmatter.com is not black owned, nor is it mine meaning copyright infringement and defamation and racketeering. So my question is when a person um, here at the Copyright Office, Library of Congress, writes a work, creates a work, and that work not only gets stolen, but then continues to, um, I'll say, get circulated in a piracy because that's the exact same thing as copying my movie and selling it bootleg. It's the exact same thing. Um, how are we, as a united people, going to stand and uphold U.S. copyrights for everybody? Because we're here at the National Book Festival, and that is what we're all about, protecting everybody's copyright. And so this is a good question, especially in the fact that that work what, was a sermon and the moral integrity of the work has been. What I, would say, what I would say, and I'm sorry for interrupting you, is that we're not copyright lawyers. We got oh. one judge up here, but um, we, don't, we don't really know that. We don't know okay. the details of your case. Okay. I don't think well, we can the, really the, answer the real that question. question thank you, thank you very much, but I'm going to have to move on. I'm going to have to move on. Thank fine. you very much. But who's, our next, who's our next questioner? Who's our next questioner? This is you can, the you can see us later. My that causes is racism Stephanie to continue. You, um, I want you to say hello to my cousin, Larry Bobo, and you get back to Boston. He's my next door neighbor. Yes. <laughs> and um, I'm chapter five in your book, Mr. Luxembourg. Ooh, um, uh -oh. I'm a descendant of Agnes Matthew. Her, Homer Plessy is on my tree. Wow. Um, my question is... Did you get her permission to put that in there? <laughs> <laughs> now, Skip, don't be starting I'm something up here. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm sorry, ma'am. I'm not interested in suing. <laughs> I have a question about... <laughs> okay. <laughs> about Judge Harlan and how he actually wrote the dissent, the one Southerner on the committee, the one person who, in reading your book, seemed least likely to do that. Do you think that's a possibility today since we now have so many judges who have flipped, gone different ways, and I still pray every day that, uh, what's his name, Clarence Thomas gets the <laughs> message. <but laughs> we, can, we can leave that alone. Hang in there, sister. <laughs> Hang in there. Let us join hands in prayer. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, Steve, I would, what do you say? It's an amazing story about Agnes Matu, who was uh, Homer Plessy's great-grandmother and was freed as a slave in 1779. Yes, my father Under the French. His, his people weren't slaves, and we looked at him and said, yeah, 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 black men in America 
we know you weren't a slave. <laughs> well, they, the, the, the mixed race group in New Orleans was in this sandwich layer. They didn't have all of their rights, but they were freed. But to answer your question about Harlan, I think that he is an example of somebody who can change, who can evolve, who can look at as Judge Waring does. There are two examples here, and I would say that, that that's one of the inspiring uh, stories in my book. Uh, but so is Frederick Douglass, who, who also changes greatly over the course of his lifetime. Mm -hmm. And you know, Frederick Douglass, in, in, in uh, 1876, he addressed the Republican National Convention, the first black man to do so. And he told them that he called it your constitution, your, your decision to enfranchise us, but he held them to account mm -hmm. and said, how are you going to follow through on what you've accomplished? Mm -hmm. That's the message I think that people who are white need to hear. We always had the power. How are we going to follow through and continue this evolution? Wonderful. Um, next question. Okay. Um, thank you, gentlemen, for coming out and uh, sharing your knowledge with us. Um, my name is Tori Burton, and my uh, question is uh, to Professor Gates here. Um, just wanted to know if you could share a little with us about the, um, some of the stories about the accomplishments and achieve, social political achievements of uh, several of these uh, Reconstruction legislatures that, um, that had several black members in their uh, oh, sure. legislature. I, I could do it quickly. Um, statewide public schools. Mm. You, you know, it's such a shock but there weren't statewide public schools in the United States. And that in many pla most places in the United States, particularly in the South. So if you were wealthy, you could educate your child privately, but there weren't statewide, I mean, there were public schools, don't get me wrong, but there weren't statewide uh, school systems. And that was one of the best things that came out of the, the reconstruction governments in the South, the black men who were elected, um, along with the white men who were elected. And, and this was America's first grand experiment with interracial democracy. It was crushed, but it, 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 at least it, it tried to get off the ground. And that was one of the most um, positive of, of the benefits. But to show you how effective voter disenfranchise, voter suppression can be, in Louisiana had their state constitutional convention in 1898. The first one, as you said, it's Mississippi in 1890. And that's when they, they found ways to circumvent the 15th Amendment through poll taxes, literacy tests, and everything. This is how effective it was. In 1898, there were 130,000 black men registered to vote in Louisiana. After the state constitution was adopted and these new um, regulations were implemented, by 1904, 130,000 had been reduced precisely to 1,342 wow. by 1904. That's amazing. And when we see voter suppression today, that's what we have to keep in mind. All right, next question. Hello, uh, my name is Jamil Rice, and I am a social studies supervisor for Pittsburgh Public Schools. All right. And thank you. Um, but I have a question. So. You say that the best way, and I believe this also, to fight against racism and white, and white supremacy is through education. However, I, I, my question is, what advice do you give someone who, or people who are trying to fight for um, quality public education for black and brown students, especially in our country, especially with social studies? When I think about your books, there are so many students who never have the opportunity to learn anything about this because they don't even have classes for it. Yeah. And in elementary school, and I don't know if people know, and I'm sorry that I'm saying this, but it's important. Students might have a social studies class once every six day rotation. One period, 45 minutes mm. in K2, maybe. Mm. And the same thing in 3-5. And so I can't help but think that that is by design, especially when I think about what the students in Parkland were able to do because they were aware. 
because they knew their rights. And so this is a civil rights issue of a great magnitude that is one of the best kept secrets that's going on in this country. So I'm just trying to find out from you all, what advice do you give people like me who are fired up and we're angry every single day because we know our students are not learning anything about how to even function in our society? Mm, yeah. Well, I think the most radical thing that could happen in the United States is that the amount of money spent per student would be exactly the same in every school district in the United States. And that would at least neutralize the economic issue, mm -hmm. you know, so that, you know, I've been very blessed. My kids went to public school in Lexington, Massachusetts, and we moved to Harvard Square. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, give me a break. But that, that's the, not the way that yeah. it is. Um, I, would, I would hesitate to tell you how to spend your time. Yeah. But you're, take your passion and other groups of people's passion and go to the school board and be active. I'm not saying it's your responsibility, but I think that it's your cause. Mm -hmm. And the only way to make it everybody's cause is to make it loud and public. That's why I'm here. I agree. Thank you. Next question. Hi. My name is Jessica Nichols, and I am a descendant of slaves, and I am a proud high school social studies teacher from Maryland. Yeah. <laughs> All right. um, I just have one quick question to anyone who wants to answer it. <laughs> and by the way, you inspired me to actually look in my family tree and found some really cool stuff. Anyway, okay. Um, what do you guys think the role of reparations could be in helping to heal the racial issues that we have buried and are not quite dealing with? Mm -hmm. Well, since I've never met a white person in private who really was for reparations, I'd like these brothers to talk. <laughs> Well, my comment about reparations would be that when, when the Senate Majority Leader ends the conversation at slavery and doesn't continue into convict labor and all of the other repressions that people of color suffered between the end of slavery and today, we don't have a real conversation about slavery and about reparations. And what role could it play? It, you know, reparations, of course, is a political matter. Uh, but reparations can be repaid in so many ways other than money, and I think it's a mistake to always reduce it to the question of payment. Education, for example. Yeah, affirmative e action. Your, your, your comment about equal amounts of money spent on every school district for every child of color or white in the country, yeah. that would be a start to reparations. I agree. I agree. Exactly. With you. exactly. And, and affirmative action. Preserving affirmative action. But, White women in this room benefited as much from affirmative action as any black person. Yep. And we need to keep it for uh, gender equality and racial equality. And it's about to go down. You know, I, I'm, I'm, I, it's just one of my worst nightmares is that when it comes up to the court, it's going to bite the dust, and that's a bad thing. Yep. Next question. Hi there. My name is Zachary, and uh, my question is if we have policies, or excuse me, trends that lead to racist outcomes, but many of the individual people are not racist who participated in them. For example, gentrification. What policy remedy would you recommend at the governmental level to sort of equalize the, uh, the outcome? I think you're exposing all of our inexpertise. Yeah. <laughs> He's a judge. He's a judge. <laughs> Can, I, I try to stay out of that lane. <laughs> can, can you rule him out of order? No. I, <laughs> I, mean, uh, I mean, what strikes me about a lot of this is we, we have to get people to admit that the driving force behind some of this legislation, behind some of these conditions, is uh, racism and prejudice. And, and, and then once we can agree on that, then we can see about pulling the systemic prejudice and racism out of the system. That's, that's, that's really what all of us are talking about trying to do. That's why we're focusing on the courts. That's why we're talking about education. That's why we're talking about the impact of desegregating the armed forces and using that as an argument for desegregating other places. We're, we're trying to look at the systemic forces that are backed in prejudice and backed in 
um, you know, what I might call opportunistic racism or strategic racism. It's about using racism to achieve a goal. Mm -hmm. And so then you sort of look at, well, how does gentrification work and what are the mechanisms that seem to be an, an element of systemic racism, of strategic racism, and can we pull those out? And, so, and, and I've always hoped, you know, that once you reveal the roots and racism of those practices, then people will have that transformation that we saw in these judges and they'll, and they'll change. But what we see now in the age of certain people, the age of Trump, is that you can reveal that racism and they still don't change. And I think that's our biggest challenge right now. Uh, so I answered it. <laughs> okay. Good, good. Next question. Hi, I, I wanted to thank you all for your wonderful presentation. Um, I have been a state trial court judge for 21 years, and I wanted to ask any of you uh, if you have any suggestions on how to stop the revolving door, because I see that on a daily basis, and you know, I see uh, particularly young people who have never received the education, the mental health treatment, uh, job training um, that they need, and then they don't receive it once they're in the criminal justice system. So how do we stop that revolving door? Well, Judge, let me um, address this because this is the issue that I think every s state and federal trial judge deals with every day. We have 5% of the world's population and 25% of the prisoners. Yep. That's something wrong with that, it's right? Crazy. <laughs> it's crazy. It's crazy. It's crazy. And um, uh, I ask every uh, young man who pleads guilty in front of me, my first question is, um, how far did you go in school? Exactly. I ask that question as and well. And uh, virtually all of them are functionally illiterate. Yes. Mm -hmm. wow. And we've been talking about education being important. Very important. It is the path to the jailhouse, the lack of it. Yeah. And it is uh, the one uniting figure of young men of color who go to jail. They have, they have not had educational achievement, educational opportunity, and we're never going to turn around until we address these problems. That's and they right. have undiagnosed trauma. And I mean, Correct. how do we, how do we, who do we hold accountable? How do we force that? Because that's not within the court purview, you know. So right. how do we do that? How do we stop that revolving door? I think that might be a question that each of us has to ask as we as we leave this room. So. Okay, we've got time for one more question. So. Yeah. Uh, Oh, brother, you got it. And uh, thank you very much, everyone else. You can I'll, I'll make uh, approach us after the, after the event if you still want to talk. Right, Go ahead. Yeah, uh, my name is Leon Pease. I'm a lawyer and lobbyist here in Washington, D.C. And my question is, uh, given that there's a necessary dialogue on race, it's been talked about over the past a number of years, do you suggest that we need or require a judicial uh, remedy to start that dialogue on race in this uh, this year some sort of some sort of judicial action or activity I, I will say that the courts have a role but the Congress has a role the executive and yeah. the people have a role mm -hmm. and it can't rely just on the courts for this we have our role and we will do our role but it has to be the entire country has to do this and educators the role that we as storytellers as, as you said we have to keep telling the story over and over and over again to younger and younger audiences. So it becomes part of our national narrative. Brian Stevenson, you know, the uh, Just Mercy, did the, I call it the lynching museum, that's not what it's properly called. <laughs> but legacy museum. The legacy museum. But Thank he, you. Um, <laughs> and I encourage you to go if you, if you haven't seen it. But um, he gave an interview in Vox Magazine a couple of years ago and he said, that it was the narrative. The South um, lost the Civil War, but it won the narrative war. And what we have to do is change the narrative. So that we, one of the reasons that I um, am so happy for the popularity of Finding Your Roots is that we have a political message that's subtle each week. And that is that we are all of one, one sort or another, but we're all immigrants in this country. Even the Native Americans came here 16,000 years ago. They came from someplace else. Our enslaved African ancestors didn't come here willingly, but they came from someplace else. And all the white people in here came from someplace else. We are all immigrants. We are all immigrants. And when we do DNA analysis, I'm so pleased because no matter what your phenotypic apparent differences are, under 
the um, uh, microscope, as it were, you're 99.99% the same. We are in all of this together. We are all Americans. We don't need walls. We need to tear the walls down. That's what we have to teach. And I would say if there's one message that I would want to tell as a storyteller is to remind this country that racial justice in America has never, never come easily or swiftly. There is always resistance. It is the history of the United States, this backlash that Professor Gates has talked about, this rollback. It's not just in Reconstruction, it's every time there's progress, there's resistance. Mm -hmm. And if we all accept that as a narrative, if we all accept that uh, that phenomenon, we will understand better than ever why it's so difficult to make progress. Mm, well put. Justice, do you have anything? I, I think it's been a wonderful discussion. Thank All you right. very much. <laughs> All right. I want to thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. One more hand Great. for Henry Louis Gates Jr., thank you. Steve Luxemburg, Great book. Justice Richard Gurgle. Thank you very much, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the best story.